Now, before we dive into individual companies and individual countries, we have the pleasure of hearing sort of a global view of uh, this uh, topic. And we are fortunate to have Nariman Berabesh, Chief Economist at IHS Global Insight, uh, to do that for us. I've been trying to get Nariman for a number of years. And a couple of years ago, he agreed but couldn't make it. And we were delighted to have Sarah Johnson uh, speak. But this year, we're going to hear it directly from Nariman. And if you looked at the bio, you know that he has been there, seen that, witnessed this. He's witnessed the ups, the downs, the highs, the lows, the rise, the fall of uh, so many of these countries. And you will see also that he has appeared on virtually every major print, radio, or TV outlet as an expert speaking on this, uh, on this topic. He got his undergraduate degree from right here at MIT and his PhD from UPenn. And he now manages 400 professionals. And his, essentially, his uh, function is to develop the outlook for these of the key economies of the world, including the emerging economies. So, and that is the topic of his talk. What is the outlook for emerging economies? It's my great pleasure to welcome Nariman. Again, thank you, Nariman, for being here. Thank you very much, Ravi. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning and to address this topic. I mean, clearly, we have been through a very volatile period with emerging markets, and I would argue it's a sort of a 20-year volatile period, as we'll, as we'll see in a few minutes. Uh, I promised Ravi that I'd leave lots of time for questions, which means that, um, uh, that I'm going to skip over some of the slides fairly quickly. But I've, I've told Ravi that uh, I'm happy to have him distribute the, the slides to anybody who would like them. So if you want a copy of the slides, please ask him, and, and I'd be very happy for him to share them with you. So. The topic then is, uh, all right, we had this golden decade, which Ravi referred to the decade of the 2000s, and followed by what could be characterized as the perfect storm. Uh, I don't like that term, but OK, it, it's sort of shorthand. And so um, basically, what I'm going to do is, let's see if I, there we go, let's very quickly touch on these topics in the next 20 or so minutes. There is a huge divergence, again, Ravi, I think, indicated this, in the performance of emerging markets. Uh, it's easy to sort of lump them together. I don't like the term BRICS. Uh, those four countries never belong together. They, sh they just don't. They're very vastly different. So I don't like that term either. I prefer things like big emerging markets. Um, but let's talk, we will talk about the, the golden decade. I think there are elements of that that were a one-off. I don't think are going to get repeated. And then the perfect storm obviously hits. Um, good news is that's beginning to ease a little bit. But the, 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 really, the question is, where do they go from here? And I, I'll give you my bottom line, which is that countries that take the bitter medicine, as it were, and do the structural reforms, and have done that to some extent, are the ones that are in a better position to grow going forward than before. Um, so in, in that sense, um, I think that there's major challenges ahead. Uh, that I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that some of these countries won't see rapid growth rates. They will. Uh, but a lot of them. Uh, will need to do some very heavy lifting in terms of structural reforms of all kinds, labor market reforms, product market reforms, more competition, less corruption. I mean, you know it. Um, and many of you have, have experienced it. Um, and so, so there's a lot of heavy lifting required if they're to go back to rapid growth rates. But let's take a look at this. Again, Ravi sort of hinted at this. this the middle line here is global growth. The bottom line is the growth in the developed world, and the top line is growth in the emerging world. And you can see, indeed, we had a brief period in the 1990s of strong growth. And then the, the real interesting period, the golden age, if you want to call it that, was the decade of the 2000s. Um, and then, of course, the Great Recession hit. And there was a brief hiatus in which everybody sort of came out of this very rapidly, developed and emerging markets. Um, some of that having to do with what Ravi mentioned in terms of the huge stimulus provided by China. But, uh, um, and, but then that didn't last. And what you can see is this very, very um, dramatic slowdown in, in growth at a time when there's no recession, there's no uh, sort of major uh, global shock going on. Well, you could argue that China's slowing is a bit of a shock. But clearly, we're looking at growth rates that are roughly half what they were in the, in the decade of the 2000s. Now, we do have a sm slight rebound uh, going forward, uh, but we do not expect 
very important point to be made, we do not expect to go back to the rapid growth rates of the 2000s. I think that's just not in the cards uh, for reasons I'll, I'll come back to because there were some very unique elements. But, but let's just delve deeper in a, in a minute and just look at this, what I call the great divergence, which is they're vast, even in this environment, where uh, you know, we've been hit, or emerging markets as a, as a group have been hit by this, this perfect storm, vast differences in performance. You've got big economies in deep recessions. Again, Ravi mentioned uh, uh, Brazil, Russia is another one, very bad uh, sort of experience going forward. And they'll, you know, maybe, maybe if they're lucky, they come out of the recession by next year. I'm talking Brazil and Russia right now. Um, and, but that's sort of pushing a point perhaps a little bit. The, the third one on that list, of course, is Venezuela, which is in deep, deep, deep trouble. We could spend a lot of time on Venezuela. I probably won't. And then what I call on the edge, these are economies that are doing you know, just barely uh, sort of keeping their head above water, but our, I would characterize Argentina and South Africa in that category. And China is sort of, I hate to say this, in a category of its own, but it is very vulnerable for reasons I'll come back to in a minute, mostly because of its very high debt levels. Um, but there are lots and lots and lots of bright spots, and I think that's one of the things I'd like to leave you with today is that even in this environment, there are lots of bright spots. Okay, we, we've all... And we, I'll mention a few things about India. India is growing quite rapidly now, assuming you believe their GDP statistics. But I mean, even even looking at other data suggests that uh, India is doing quite nicely, um, growing probably faster than China right now, and will for some time. Indonesia is another one uh, that's doing reasonably well, and a number of the other Southeast Asian economies: Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia is in there uh, as well. And then, and then some surprises. You know, why do I have Iraq in there, for example? Well, you know, despite all the problems with ISIS, there are parts of the Iraqi economy that are actually doing fairly well. You know, oil production's rising, oil prices are being to rise, so this will help the Iraqi economy. Iran, uh, there's an easier story there in terms of sanctions being removed, but, uh, but, uh, but that's another one. And, and I could uh, add other countries in here. Uh, Ghana, for example, is, is another one that's doing well. Ethiopia as well. Uh, e even in this environment. Uh, some of these, by the way, one of the reasons they're doing well, interesting point, Kenya, Kenya being one of them, Ethiopia, another one, India, they're oil consumers. So low oil prices are actually helping these economies. Okay, they're hurting others, but they're helping these economies. So my point here is that even in this tough environment, and it's a tough environment, there are some bright spots. And the way I characterize bright spots, by the way, on this list is growth of 4% or higher. So this list, and there are others, as I said, I could add Malaysia and so on, uh, growing 4% plus. That's very, very good growth in this, in this kind of environment. All right, let's move on now. Uh, and this just, this just sort of amplifies the point. This, these, are, these are the bricks, basically, and you can see really since 2010 they've been moving in, in two different tiers. You've got China and India at the top and, of course, Brazil and Russia at the bottom. All right. So let's, let's quickly go through uh, the, the elements of this golden decade. Um, they're, they're very unique in many ways and uh, probably will not be repeated anytime soon. Uh, one was the commodity super cycle in the sense that we saw commodity prices rise very dramatically during the decade of the 2000s. They, of course, fell with the recession, but then bounced right back, but then since then have, have fallen off a cliff. Um, we're not going to get that rebound in commodity prices or, or, or strength in commodity prices that we had in the decade of the 2000s. Second, the so-called hyper-globalization. This was a lot of companies offshoring, development of global supply chains. That wave is behind us. In, in fact, the, the reverse seems to be happening a little bit. We're starting to get some localization of, of production, some reshoring occurring. Um, and, uh, and the shortening of supply chains, um, something I'll come to in a second when I talk about the slowdown in global trade. But that's, you know, that, that whole wave is pretty much behind us. Um, and then, of course, the big drop that we saw in global interest rates and the big boom in global liquidity that occurred throughout the 2000s, which, of course, fueled housing bubbles and, 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 and credit bubbles of all kinds, and eventually, of course, the, the big recession. In, in, in that, before the recession hit, this was what uh, uh, investors referred to as a risk-on environment, which is to say you're constantly looking for uh, higher rates of return elsewhere in the world. You're not going to safety, you're going for risk, uh, and of course a lot of investors uh, piled into the emerging world. The big unfortunate thing that occurred, or didn't occur, I should say, during this, uh, this 
uh, period, this decade, was structural reforms. I mean, clearly these markets needed to do a lot to improve efficiency, to improve productivity, and they didn't. Why? They enjoyed the ride. It's like, politically, it's, it's, it's easy to say, look, we're doing great. We don't need to do anything more. And that's exactly what they did, what they did or didn't do, uh, as the case may be. And of course, that, that they, you know, they were hurt by that later on because a lot of the, the reforms necessary to continue to grow, even as the global environment turned worse, just weren't done and weren't there. So then now, the, the, the flip side, so the, this, the, the, we, we talked about the boom and the bust. So the bust, uh, there was a sort of a sequence of events. I, I started basically the bust for emerging world somewhere around 2013 during the period called taper panic. And this was the time when the Fed started to ease off its purchases of, um, uh, of bonds. Um, and in effect, markets began to sort of factor in the reduction in this liquidity bubble or the deflation of this liquidity bubble. And uh, during that period, uh, the currencies of, of many emerging markets were hammered. Now, what this did was create a huge dilemma for central banks in those countries because, of course, a plunging currency pushes up inflation rates. And so you, you, what was going on then is that central banks in countries like Brazil, for example, had to raise interest rates at a time when their economies were slowing or in some cases in recession. Um, and it's a huge dilemma for these, uh, for these central banks and for the policymakers. So, so this, this added to the problems. And then, of course, about a year later, in the middle of 2014, we got the collapse in uh, commodity prices. And it, it truly was a collapse. And commodity prices at one point were less than half in, uh, the, what, what they were uh, at, at the peak. Um, and of course, that affected. Uh, not only export earnings, but uh, government revenues in a, a number of these countries. Russia, for example, uh, its government revenues budgets were hammered again, hurt very badly, squeezed. Uh, uh, so in that, that was a big problem. And then against this backdrop, we have a slowdown in world trade, significant slowdown in world trade. World trade is growing at roughly half the, the rate in volume terms that it was in the 2000s. And of course, a lot of these countries had developed export-led models of growth, and so that was another reason. And then finally, of course, we had this big panic that occurred last summer and again in January in terms of sell-offs in, in, uh, in the stock markets. Um, good, news, good news is that some of these pressures are beginning to ease. You're starting to see exchange rates starting to come up, commodity prices are starting to come up, stock markets are starting to come up, so a lot of those pressures are easing. They're, they're not gone. Uh, you know, the environment still is not great, but it's better than it was, uh, say, a year ago. But that said, because of what wasn't done in the 2000s and still certainly wasn't done during this panic period, long-term growth prospects for a lot of these economies don't look that good because, number one, demographics are slowing, in China in particular is an, an extreme case, India less so. But clearly, population growth, labor force growth is slowing. But not enough has been done to compensate for that in terms of higher productivity growth. And so long-term growth prospects, very important point, are not that great these I mean, they're not bad. They're not horrible. But they're not that great. So for, for these economies to return to the kind of growth rates that they experienced, um, uh, in, in the 2000s. I mean, I don't think they'll be able to get back up there, but to, to, to have stronger growth than they have now will require, as I said, a lot of tough, tough kinds of policies that are politically very unpopular. One has to say up front that structural reforms are one of the least popular or most unpopular kinds of policies that governments can put in place. So it's not easy. I'm not going to pretend it's going to be easy. All right, let me just highlight a, a couple of these trends that I've talked about with, with some slides, with some graphs. This is the exchange rate story. You can see starting in somewhere in the middle of 2013, that taper panic started a big, long, in some cases, very dramatic slide in the exchange rates of some of these big emerging markets. The one that didn't, wasn't that affected were, of course, the one at the top, which is the Chinese renminbi, because it was tightly controlled. China is now allowing gradual, very gradual depreciations in its currency. But all this talk about China manipulating its currency by certain uh, presidential candidates is true, except that it manipulated it in favor of the US and in favor of other emerging markets. In other words, by not letting it plunge and not letting it get into a competitive devaluation. 
So China is not the culprit here. I mean, you can, if, if there's a culprit, it's markets. Uh, but the point here is that most other currencies have depreciated during this last couple of years much more than the Chinese renminbi. Chinese renminbi is expected, we, we do expect it to continue to slide very gradually. The government will control it, that decline very, very tightly. Um, but, it, but it's nothing like what we saw, let's say, in the case of the ruble, which is the dark blue line, or the, the Brazilian real. Um, but nevertheless, they all got hit. And China's, by the way, currency did come under intense downward pressure. It, uh, the, the massive capital flows, especially over the last year out of China, but to the tune of about $1 trillion. So China's come under pressure, but the government has dealt with it in a, in a very tight kind of controlled way because it does not want that kind of instability. This is the, exchange, uh, this is the uh, commodity price story. I've got this in the next slide. You can see, of course, the, the oil prices shot up during the, what, what's been called the commodity super cycle then plunged during the recession, and then came right back briefly, and then, of course, plunged again. And the reason for the second plunge was not a recession, but, in fact, that you had this massive, what's been referred to, massive structural oversupply. Too many producers producing too much oil, basically. And some of the, you know, the biggest players here, of course, had become the U.S. shale producers, um, where U.S. production rose very dramatically during the... Uh, uh, during the early uh, 2010s. Um, it's cut back a little bit now, but probably not enough. I think, our, I think we may be a little too aggressive in terms of raising oil prices and uh, our forecast for oil prices in the future. I suspect that line is going to be shallower. There's a lot of supply out there, not just in the U.S., but in other parts of the world. And already the, the British have agreed to allow uh, fracking um, uh, in, in, in their shale beds, and we, we could start to see the UK becoming a major producer of shale oil. So very interesting new development recently. Uh, other commodity prices, essentially the same story. Too much supply. I mean, this is not a demand, this is not a shortfall in demand, it's excess supply that's driving, uh, that drove these prices down, and, and will keep them from rising too much. Very important point here. We are not going back in terms of commodity prices to the good old days, I think, that for the emerging world at least. Uh, I could spend a lot of time on this. There are, just suffice it to say, there are structural and cyclical reasons for the slowdown in trade. The cyclical reasons will come back a little bit, uh, but I think we are probably no longer going to be in a world in which, and let me just do it in, in light of this slide, uh, if you look at history uh, of the last 20 years, trade growth has been twice that of output growth. So trade has grown twice as fast as GDP. Going forward, because of some of the structural slowdown, including the fact that the trade is, is shifting from goods to services or from goods to, to data, I mean, a perfect example of that is yeah, more and more people are actually you know, you, viewing videos on, on data streaming rather than buying DVDs. That affects trade volumes. And that's just one tiny little example. There are lots and lots like that. Uh, so the point is that trade is happening, but it's happening in bits and bytes rather than, rather than hard hard goods, and that affects trade volumes. But the point is, going forward, we think trade growth will only be slightly higher than GDP growth. It's not going to be those boom years that we had. And that, that will affect, obviously, the, the, the growth model of, of the emerging world. Um, and this is probably the biggie in the sense that China was acting for some parts of the world, the emerging world and, and Asia in particular as an engine of growth. And this shows you the, uh, the merchandise trade imports going into China. This is the pull, if you will. This is China as a locomotive of growth in the rest of the world. And you can see that that number has just steadily deteriorated and is now in negative territory. So Chinese imports are falling. So this is a big deal. Now, this is, this is temporary. This is part of the cyclical story. And that'll come back, but certainly not all the way to the fast growth rates that China had in the uh, let's say in the 2000s, after it acceded to the WTO, after it joined the World Trade Organization. All right, very quickly now, just a couple of minutes, I'm going to touch the highlights of three or four regions of the world, and then I'll stop to, to leave time for questions. Let's start first with, with Latin America. I mean, Latin America, just jumping down to, again, as I said, uh, you can have access to these slides, it's fine, but just jumping down all the way to the bottom, a bullet point here, the big, big challenge, long-term challenge uh, for Latin America is inadequate infrastructure, restrictive business conditions, 
uh, you know, Brazil's a, an extreme case where it's overregulated, very tough to do business in Brazil, and of course, income inequality, a big deal, and corruption, of course. Um, now, Brazil is, is again, a, a, you know, a, 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 one of the extreme examples here. It's not just that they've had a, a bust in the commodity markets. It's not just that they've had a political crisis, but this has been coming for some time. Um, people often talk about the Brazil cost. Uh, an iPad in Brazil costs twice as much as it does in New York. Um, it's all because of taxes. It's all because of regulations. Uh, they can't keep that up. They just can't. Uh, and survive in some, in some meaningful sort of long-term growth sense. So that has to change. But this, this shows you our growth forecast, and you can see that we've got a number of uh, economies in, in, in stress or distress, Brazil, obviously, all the way on the, on the left. One of them, uh, Argentina, as I mentioned, sort of on the edge, and then Venezuela is a mess. Uh, again, we could spend time on Venezuela. Disaster It's the only way to describe it. But then you've got the, the ones on the right, here that are doing okay. They're not all, I mean, a couple of them are getting close to that 4% bright spot definition that I had earlier, uh, but they're doing all right. Uh, and in particular, I think I would highlight sort of Colombia, Peru, and even Mexico as countries that are beginning, beginning to put in place some structural reforms that will pay off. Um, emerging Europe, um, a little on the dull side, but certainly benefiting from the fact that Europe's Western Europe is doing a little better than, than before. But of course, the big story is Russia, which has been hit by that's a, what I call a triple whammy. You've got the fact that even before the hostilities, that uh, Russia made it very difficult for foreign investors to invest in, uh, in Russia, and essentially, especially in the energy sectors. Essentially, what they said is, we don't want your money. It's an odd thing to say, but that's what they said. Uh, then, of course, on top of that, you had the, uh, the, uh, the, their invasion of Crimea and then uh, uh, Eastern Ukraine and the sanctions. And then, of course, you know, the, uh, the, the final uh, whammy was the collapse in, uh, in oil prices. So uh, you've got Russia in deep, deep recession right now. Two very big negative years. And let's just see if we can bring that up. And you can see that over there. So not quite, perhaps, as bad as, uh, as Brazil but pretty bad nonetheless. Um, the rest of the region doing OK. It, they're not growing fast enough for me to characterize them as sort of bright spots, but they're doing, you know, this, this is decent growth. Um, there, there are some issues in the sense that there, you know, uh, there, there's some political risks in places like Poland where the government seems to be going back to its bad old ways. You know, some, some of the, 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 the restrictions on things like the media and so forth remind uh, people of the of the battle days of communism, but so the, the bit of a concern, and and, and Hungary as well. I guess you got two governments there that are just almost like flirting with the with the way things were done 30 years ago, 35 years ago. Um, Asia Pacific still the bright spot and will likely remain the bright spot. Let me just focus a couple of comments on China and India. India I've talked about. Let me just say a couple of words here. India will probably grow faster. Than, than China going forward, at least for some time. Um, the, and, and the good news is the Modi government has made some progress on reforms, but I think the disappointment is that he hasn't been able, to, his government hasn't been able to do even more. Uh, there's there's a sort of a, a good reason, story behind that, but nevertheless, there is still disappointment that not more has been done. But, but good news is they've started in the right direction and they're doing a lot of the right things. China's the big worry here, and I, you know, I could spend a whole hour on China, but let me just make a, a couple of quick points here. China's growth is slowing and has been slowing since 2010. 2010, China grew 10.5%. Last year, if you believe the statistics, it was below 7%. It's probably more like 6 to 6.5, six and, um, and maybe even lower than that. Uh, so China's slowing, no question about it. But the big, big, big challenge facing China is the explosion in, in debt. Since 2007, debt in China has been growing at twice the rate of GDP. So just to put some numbers out there, the debt to GDP ratio went from 120% in 2007 to about, it's roughly 280% right now. That's higher than the US debt was before the crisis. Now, China's not going to go through a crisis like we did. Uh, its government finances are in pretty good shape. Its banks are largely government-owned, sponsored. It just won't have that. 
What is much more likely in the case of China is more like Japan's last decade. In other words, a decade or two in which the resolution of this debt, namely bringing it down, will lower growth. Uh, that's the big worry about China. Now, related to that, what was this debt used for? Two things. One I worry about less, one I worry about more. The one I worry about less is, is real estate. OK, you know, real estate, there was a real estate bubble. It's arguably deflating. It's hurting the construction sector. Fine. Big deal. Much bigger deal is the fact that a lot of this debt was used to finance huge amounts of excess capacity in things like steel, chemicals, iron ore, automotive. These are companies, 90% of the companies in these sectors are losing money. I mean, we know in a capitalist society how this story ends. It's consolidation, reducing capacity. Chinese say they want to do this, but the downside is, of course, is increases their unemployment rate and increases social tensions. And so they're moving very, very slowly, which is exactly the way the Japanese did it in the 1990s and 2000s, which killed their growth. Japan, just to kind of put things in perspective, Japan's two lost decades, average growth was 1% a year. China's probably going to be more like 4% a year in that period. But they've barely started. And the longer they wait, the bigger the adjustment. So this just shows you very quickly the growth rates in China. We think China can probably, through government policies, hold growth up just a little above 6%. India, you can see, is is doing uh, better than that. Indonesia holding up at around five, and then you've got Malaysia, Philippines, Vietnam also growing well above four percent. These, as, as I've referred to, the bright spots. Uh, China's growth slowing. A lot of this is demographics. China now has one of the most rapidly aging populations in the world, so long-term growth is diminishing quite considerably. A lot of it, again, because of the demographic factors. And this is the debt explosion. I've already talked about this. So I won't dwell on this, but you can see that a uh, huge, huge increase in, in debt, really starting at about 2008, 2007. Middle East and Africa, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these two uh, regions. They're, they're largely very commodity dependent, although, interestingly enough, not all the economies are being hurt, again, because some of them are commodity importers. So, for example, in the, in the Middle East, you know, lower oil prices actually help Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, and Tunisia. So it's not all bad news. Um, but I think the, the, the big worry here is, of course, the drop in oil prices. All right, so we're seeing a little bit of relief there. Huge amounts of regional political instability. And of course, the war uh, with the Islamic State is a big problem for a number of the economies there, Syria, obviously, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, uh, being very badly hurt. And, and arguably, uh, to the extent that ISIS is, is deep in Libya, Libya is another one uh, as well. And so you can, see, you can see here that even despite all of this, we've got a few countries that are, that are doing uh, reasonably well. Um, uh, Iran, as I said, Iraq as well. All right, then last region very quickly, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Again, uh, uh, we, you know, the, the, a lot of bright spots, many of them commodity or oil importers. And you can see that here, Kenya, Ethiopia, Ghana. Uh, but again, very vulnerable uh, to uh, commodity prices in general. And they need to do a lot more in terms of uh, infrastructure. I mean, big, big deal. Infrastructure is uh, and, and poor quality of infrastructure, especially if electricity production is a big, big deal uh, in, this, in this region, in, including a place like uh, South Africa. South Africa has major problems in terms of its electricity grid. Um, and so that's a you know, big challenge. And then, of course, you know, corruption and so forth uh, are a big deal as well. So let me just, I'm going to skip this slide. This is long-term growth rates. And this is my last one. I just want to spend a couple of minutes just to summarize what I've been saying so far. So um, we went through the boom. <coughs> unlike, very unlikely, that's going to be repeated because of, you know, all the tailwinds that were in place then just aren't there now in terms of commodities, in terms of globalization, in terms of credit. Just aren't there. Um, in terms of the bust, you know, the perfect storm, of course, you had the collapse in commodities, collapse in uh, uh, currencies, uh, collapse in... in, in uh, stock markets, and then the slowdown in trade. Again, many of those are beginning to ease. That's the good news. So the worst is probably behind us in terms of what's going on in emerging markets. However, 
to, to grow at any decent pace in terms of 4% plus, let's just kind of use that as the, as the guidepost, uh, these countries have to do much more than they have so far in terms of improving competition, reducing the scope of the state and state involvement. I mean, even in places like India, not just the national government, the local government, just too much involved in businesses. You know, businesses have to be sort of given much more freedom than they have in, in a lot of these economies. Brazil is a perfect example of that. Government's far too involved uh, in, uh, in, in the economy. And in, in countries, for example, like Mexico, where you're starting to see uh, a move towards privatization of things like Pemex, we are becoming more and more optimistic that, that a country like Mexico can do better. So the point is there are concrete examples of countries that have implemented structural reforms that uh, are doing and will do quite well. So let me stop there. I ran over a little bit, Ravi, forgive me, but I have left some time for questions. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Yes, go ahead, please. We have a few minutes for uh, questions. I'm going to abuse my uh, control of the uh, mic here to ask the first, first question. Narman, you've covered the economic risks and the uh, developments very, very thoroughly. But of course, you also look at the political risks in many of these countries. And I have been taking our uh, executives, uh, MBA students, to China for the last 10 years. And this time, particularly, came, we came back with the feeling that political risk, as, as opposed to the economic risks, in China are higher than I think I've ever uh, sensed before. Uh, I even heard completely unreliable sources, but you have to depend on unreliable sources for some of the stuff in China, that there, there were two assassination attempts on Xi Jinping that he's changed his bodyguards twice. I mean, this is the kind of stuff you would never read about anywhere. Yeah. But, but if it's true, and if something like that were ever to happen, the, the entire China story becomes much, much worse than even a 4% uh, scenario. Could you comment on the political risks yeah. in the global yeah. environment? No, I, and let's start with China. I mean, I think the, the, the thing that's very evident and has been for the last couple of years is Xi Jinping has consolidated power under the guise of reform under the guise of this anti-corruption campaign, but it's very much a, a question of consolidating power in a way that really hasn't been done since the days of Deng Xiaoping. Um, and, and increasingly, you hear the stories that he's making a lot of enemies in the process. So um, no surprise that, that this kind of uh, anxiety, this kind of um, um, assassination attempts, uh, this kind of anger is starting to manifest itself. And I'm guessing we'll see more of that. I, okay, probably, this is a police state. It could probably survive this, although you, you, you never can tell. But, uh, but it, is, um, it is very disconcerting and very worrisome because what Japan needs is more decentralization rather than more centralization. And what, what seems to be happening, again, under the guise of this anti-corruption campaign is a, is a much tighter grip by the central government of a lot of aspects of China's political and economic life. So that's a big, big, I, th I think, growing risk is the way I would say. Um, and then, of course, there are other countries we, which we can spend a lot of time on as well. I mean, um, I don't know if there are others people want to talk yeah, about. Maybe, I mean, maybe others would like to yeah, jump in. Any, sure. Anybody have a question? Armin. Narman, I have a question um, related to some of these countries which are showing uh, favorable GDP growth, not a negative GDP, GDP growth like Brazil and Russia. Uh, what is your, can you put, put some texture on consumer confidence in these countries? Are they directly correlated to this, uh, to this worry that we are forecasting or are they kind of somehow decoupled? Yeah, again, good question. I think consumers uh, very much, it, it, it's affected by which country you're in, and are you a commodity exporter, commodity importer? I mean, I, I'm being simplistic here, but so, uh, you know, a country like Brazil, obviously, big commodity exporter, terrible political situation, big amounts of debt, consumer confidence is in the basement, isn't it? and business confidence. You look at business confidence numbers, Brazil's probably one of the lowest of the big economies. On the other hand, um, India, I think you know, both business and consumer confidence is doing you know, fairly well. Um, uh, the, the central bank seems to be sort of on top of things. Uh, um, 
Mr. Rajan seems to, you know, at least, although there's a lot of talk about him being replaced, but I think on the other hand, he seems to have done a very good job of keeping inflation kind of under, under control, which is good for consumers, so that's helping consumer confidence. And then, you know, you can go on from there, but it, it, it very much depends on, on the economy um, uh, as to, as to uh, so in, in a broad sense, commodity importers and, and cons consumers in commodity importing countries tend to be more upbeat than consumers and businesses in commodity exporting countries. But again, that's a simplistic view, but it, 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 it is. I, I teach international business here to um, undergraduate and graduate students, and one of the topics we discuss is the new development bank um, yeah. from the BRICS. So I'm curious, what are your thoughts? What are the implications of all these challenges in emerging markets for the new development bank? Do you think it's going to slow down lending pro to projects? Uh, is it going to probably dissolve anytime soon? You know, it's still not a competitor to the World Bank, but yeah. what are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, I mean, clearly there's a big need for financing of infrastructure of education. So the need for that is there, is there and it's, it's big and it's growing. And so in that sense, anything that facilitates the funding of infrastructure, I strongly support. The worry I have about this particular uh, institution that's being talked about is who's gonna provide the funding? And it comes down to one country, basically, China. And I think China's in some financial difficulty, so the question is, okay, uh, you know, how much is China really, really gonna be able to provide? And what kind of strings are gonna be attached to it? Because we know, for example, in terms of China's investment in Africa, a lot of strings attached and a lot of mixed feelings on the part of the African governments who've accepted China's help about the, the, so the quality of that help and how many jobs it's creating for Africans versus Chinese. So this is a bit of a concern. There, some of more, my more cynical colleagues talk about this as a way for China to outsource some of its, uh, and export some of its construction capacity. So this is China funding infrastructure outside of China because there's so much idle capacity in construction within China. I'm not sure I buy into that, but it's certainly a motivation. But So I would say definitely the need is there. Definitely this is a good idea. The issue is how is it being done? Who's funding it? Okay, one last question, perhaps. Yeah, I'm Jorge Rivera from Framingham State University. Um, the influence of Venezuela in the region in Latin America is vanishing. Yes. Uh, and uh, do you see any possibilities of political changes that will change the trajectory of the mess, as you mentioned, that is happening <laughs> over there? Look, economic forecasting is hard enough. Political forecasting is nigh impossible. Um, I would say, I'm guessing that sooner or later there will be a major change in government in Venezuela, whether it's a military coup or some other. I mean, as you know, Venezuela has a long history of military coups. Um, I mean, the thing is that Chavez had charisma, even though he ran the economy into the ground. Maduro does not, okay, that's very clear. So sooner or later he will be replaced. Exactly how, it's hard to tell. So hopefully, you know, the kind of government that comes in may be a little more technocratic, a little more like we hope Argentina's new government is going to be. So I think there's hope. I mean, there's definitely, this is a rich, this is a rich economy. This economy has huge, vast resources that have been completely squandered. So the, but the potential for Venezuela is great. It's just, it's, it's you know, obviously not been realized. So I think it will change, I think, inevitably. I mean, the, the, you know, the popular unrest is rising. When does it get to that tipping point is always a little hard to tell. So again, thank, if we're done with questions, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.